Okay, everybody, so let's get started. So it's the EIP seminar, but we also have the uh, machine learning conference this week. We're very happy to introduce for the EIP seminar today, Helena Domingo Sanchez. And uh, Helena did her PhD in Bologna. And so the question I want to ask you is, have you eaten a trattoria datoni on Rio Gesturigi? <laughs> Do you remember? The, uh, trattoria? The trattoria d'Atoni on Via Gusturigi. Uh, I was more from uh, uh, Osteria de Lorsa, was my favorite. Yeah, because I used to live above that uh, trattoria. <laughs> okay, so um, currently, well, you sent me your bio, which is very... It's too long, I know. It's very long, yeah, but so uh, I guess the interesting thing for people at EAP is that now you're currently at uh, Sefka in Teruel, which is very nice. Have any, has anyone been to Teruel? It's a lovely place to visit. Uh, Helena tells me they have too many tourists, which is hard to believe, but uh, <laughs> it's a lovely place. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk today, which covers a lot of the themes that were in our machine learning conference. So, uh, oh yes, one other important point. Uh, we'll be going to the restaurant that I've reserved nearby with the speaker. There's still a few spots available, so please come and talk to me at the end of the uh, presentation. So, Helena, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here giving the IAP Colloquium Seminar, and it's even more to be in this beautiful room with this professional setup. Um, I prepared this talk for, uh, as an IAP Colloquium, so for a, a broad audience. So for the people attending the Machine Learning Seminar, most of these things may be basics for you. Um, I'm sorry about that, but I, I didn't want to, to, to change the audience. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I've been uh, interested in deep learning uh, in the last few years, which is for uh, galaxy morphology or classification of galaxy images more bo broadly. And this is the list of collaborators, uh, and the order is not random, it's just uh, decreasing size. <laughs> and uh, I like this picture because it shows an oak. I'm from Salamanca. Oaks are very common there, and it's a beautiful image with, with uh, a beautiful galaxy. What can you expect about this talk? Um, I will try to convince you that we care about galaxy morphology, why deep learning is the correct tool to measure it. Uh, I will focus then on um, uh, a big part of my work, which is supervised deep learning, in particular convolutional neural networks. Uh, but because you need labels for that, then I will go to what happens if you don't have labels. And I will uh, uh, explain a little bit uh, different techniques like transfer, transfer learning, the use of emulations, or unsupervised learning. And I'll end up with a new project that I'm wo working on, which is about going deeper in the universe. So why do we care about galaxy morphology? If you look at the sky, most of you know this picture very well. But one thing that strikes at first is that there are many, many galaxies and they're very different. They not only have different colors, they have different shapes. They have different sizes. Some of them have beautiful spiral arms, like this one here. Some of them are just round and, and red, right? So because we know they have different shapes, it's a good point to measure that. And already in the early century, Hubble realized that there was a transition in this galaxy morphology which was, is known since then as the Hubble classification scheme, where basically you have two main groups, one which you could call the early type galaxies, which are round, uh, where they're elliptical, smooth, and with reddish colors with no, any, uh, no features at all. And then you have the late type galaxies, which start having very nice spiral arms, they have uh, more importance of the bulge component as we move from the left to the right. Uh, some of them can have a bar in their centers, which are the ones down here. And then there's a third group, which are the irregular ones, which don't have well-determined shapes. And in between, there is this transition group, which are called the lenticular galaxies, which they have a disk and a bulge, but they, but they don't have spiral arms. If you order this sequence, you will get what we call the T-type, where uh, T-type below zero usually corresponds to elliptical galaxies, and T-type above zero usually corresponds to spiral galaxies, and as you go to higher values, they will have more spiral arms and less 
bulge component. The funny thing is that when you look at these uh, shapes, they are very, in, very much correlated to intrinsic properties. For example, spiral galaxies are intermediate and low mass galaxies with young stellar populations because they're still forming stars in the spiral arms and they are uh, supported by rotational velocity. And on the other hand, most of the elliptical galaxies are dead objects that stopped forming star, uh, stars a long time ago and have evolved passively sin the, since then. They're the most massive objects in the local universe and, uh, and uh, they're kinematically support, dominated by velocity dispersions. So indeed, this morphology relates to fundamental galaxy properties and we can see that from uh, this cartoon where, what, what I plot, where it's shown here is the star formation rate, is the number of stars per year that a galaxy forms versus its total uh, stellar mass. And you can see that there is a, a nice uh, relation here uh, uh, which is called the main sequence where galaxies have a star formation rate proportional to their mass and this main sequence is mostly populated by spiral galaxies. And if you, for galaxies that have lower star formation rate as expected by their mass, these are mostly elliptical galaxies, very round, gal uh, round galaxies with an important bulge component. And here, uh, there, this cartoon also highlights that there are some fast rotators and there are slow rotators. And if, uh, most of the spiral galaxies are fast rotators, but there are also some elliptical fast rotator galaxies that was recently discovered thanks to IFU observations. We can do this plot with real data. Uh, here, uh, as a proxy of the morphology, uh, are, uh, the plot uses the CERSIC index, which is a measurement of the, uh, the uh, um, light profile concentration. So basically, low CERSIC index is a proxy for spiral, high CERSIC index is a proxy for ellipticals. And you can see here again the star formation rate mass plane. One thing that comes out to your mind is this very uh, uh, straight relation is the main sequence populated by spiral galaxies, and then you have the red sequence populated by elliptical galaxies. And this has existed already since uh, red sieve above uh, around two, you already see this relation, and there were already quenched galaxies as uh, as long time ago as Red Sift 2. What we want to understand is how these uh, morphological transformations have changed across time, and how this is related to their capacity for forming stars. And this is summarized in this very complex plot, where. Uh, the, um, what is shown is the uh, star formation rate density, so the, densi the capacity uh, of forming stars per arc sec versus the age of the universe, or red sieve if you prefer, for all the galaxies, for the star forming ones, and for the passives. So I want you to focus for the star, formation gal for the star forming galaxies. Uh, at the very beginning, most of the contribution for the star formation was in irregular galaxies, which was then uh, mostly transformed into spiral galaxies. On the other hand, the passive galaxies, uh, the star formation rate density is mostly contained in, um, in bulge galaxies. Uh, these are uh, spheroids or, uh, or uh, these plus spheroids. So there is a clear connection between having a bulge and being quenched. But we don't really understand what causes what. Is the morphological transformation that quenches the star formation, or is the other way around? And therefore, this is a very open question. It's uh, crucial for uh, our understanding of the universe to have large and accurate morphological classifications of galaxies to tackle this issue. So, as you can imagine, one way to classify galaxies morphologically is to check the images one by one. But as most of you know, uh, upcoming surveys will observe billions of galaxies, so this is completely impossible task. And therefore, uh, machine learning, and in particular deep learning, is a very practical tool. It has been applied uh, to many different tasks uh, through the last 10 years with a lot of success. 
And in particular, deep learning is optimized for image analysis, and gal galaxies can be seen as images. So it's a, 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 and the classification problem of cats and dogs is very similar to the classification problem of elliptical spiral. Uh, here, uh, there's a plot that I just uh, grabbed from the internet yesterday. I even forgot to say that, uh, to remove the download data in CVS. <laughs> but basically, you can see how this, uh, the, this is the, the number of papers with the word convolution, which is a proxy for deep learning, in the last 10 years. And you can see how this has exploded, um, especially uh, after uh, 2018. Uh, so as people from the, from the conference know, deep learning has matured a lot, and now it has started being normalized as a tool for astronomy. And in particular, I think that one of the greatest success is for classification of galaxy images. So for those of you who are not familiar with deep learning, what do we mean by deep learning? First, uh, deep learn, uh, let's try to understand what is a neural network. A neural network is nothing else but a very complex mathematical function, okay? Basically, you have an input, which could be a vector of n dimensions, and then it goes through this kind of uh, hidden layers uh, which will do some mathematical transformations that I will explain now, and basically gives you an output of n dimensions where this, uh, the output dimensions usually is smaller than the input dimensions. So what the, are these mathematical operations? For each of these neurons in the hidden layer, so let's take this one, it will receive the input, all the inputs, okay? So this neuron is connected with all of the previous ones, and it will be connected with a set of weights, which will be summed up and then activated with a function, which can be a psych mode or whatever. And this propagates all over uh, up to the end. So basically, this is just a mathematical function. You have an input to some maths and get an output. The, the nice thing about this is that how you optimize this function, okay? You want to minimize your loss where your loss is basically the difference between your input and your output, and you can use a loss like a binary cross entropy. And you do that through <coughs> gradient descent. So you do a first random uh, number of weights and measure your value. Then you take, you shift a little bit your weights to one direction, and you compute again your loss. If it's smaller, then you moved in the right direction. So you take a step in that direction again. If your weights are larger, then you change direction. And this is what is called gradient descent, and it's how you can optimize your loss function, and you train for different epochs. And this is basically uh, how a neural network works. What is a convolutional neural network? Well, it's the, the first part, the last part is the same, but before that, there is a convolutional part where basically your input is not a vector now, but it's a, an array, and you convolve it with different filters. Um, so these are the effect of convolving the number six with different filters, and at the end you flatten all these numbers, so basically you just yes, convert an array into a vector, and then you start doing your, uh, your neural network operations until you get one value which is more probable than the others. In this case, successfully, is the number six. Uh, and one thing that I want to clarify is that the, the weights of these convolutions are learned by the machine. Okay, so deep learning has exploded. Here are a number of, uh, of references. Uh, if your name is not here, blame Mark Huertas because I borrowed this from his talk last week. Uh, and as you can see, I'm not going to refer to all these papers, but I'm going to focus on my two papers, uh, which uh, may, uh, were relatively um, pioneers in the sense, for example, that were the first one to publish a catalog based on deep learning, and also one of the first to use transfer learning in, in astronomy. Okay, so I'm going to focus now on uh, this work, supervised learning using convolutional neural networks. Because it's supervised, you need a data set that has been previously classified because you need your labels. Uh, thankfully, we had the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has sampled one, one third of the sky uh, with a 2.5 meter telescope. And we uh, counted at the time of the paper with two 
catalogs. One the Galaxy Zoo catalog that um, includes classifications of 240,000 uh, galaxies, and it's based on a classification scheme where, oops, sorry, oh no, uh, where basically uh, you can see that uh, the users, because this is a, a citizen's uh, science project, uh, are asked some questions and depending on their answers, they move through a decision tree and then you have a catalog of uh, different classifications uh, for different galaxies. And then there is the Nair and Abraham catalog, which is a small, much smaller, only 14,000 galaxies, but it's much more detailed and it's done by professional astronomers. It includes a T-type, so the sequence that I showed you before, and it also includes uh, the bars, uh, rings, etc. So this is the architecture of the neural network that we use. Uh, the input is a, an array of 60 times, uh, uh, 60, uh, 69 times 69 pixels, where the cutout is proportional to the size of the galaxy. So the, the galaxy occupies more or less the same region independent of its distance or its intrinsic size. Then there is this, uh, and the flux is normalized. Big, and, and we don't want, it's normalized uh, removing the color information. So we are removing any color and any size information in, in this, in this uh, pro project. And you can see, uh, so here are the number of weights. So you start with 3,000 weights, but when you move through this complex neural network, the, the number of free parameters of this uh, equation is 2 million, right? But that is why it's so successful, and that is also why it needs a lot of training sample. The classification scheme that we um, designed was the following. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, first, we have a model that separates elliptical from early type, from late type galaxies. It's a binary classification. Within them, we also separate ellipticals from lenticulars, and we identify BART and edge-on galaxies. And you can see some cutouts here, color coded according to their class. And, uh, and there's also a regression model that returns the T-type. Okay, so you have the binary classification and a regression model. And in the paper in 2022, we refined the models that we developed in 2019 by, for example, determining better the T-type, uh, including the early type, late type model, and also including an uncertainty estimation and a visual classification. Uh, the fact that the T-type is, so here you can see the, the output. This is the predicted T-type versus the input T-type from the NIR catalog. And you can see uh, for the, the new uh, catalog is, uh, is the red line. There is a very, very nice correlation. Of course, it breaks up a little bit at the end because there are few, uh, very few galaxies with such high T-types. And here you have the comparison between the early type uh, galaxies classified as early type and late type by the binary classification and their T-type also according to our own model. So you can see that while there are no late type galaxies with T-type below zero, there's a tail of early type galaxies with T-type uh, uh, greater than zero and I'll go back to them in a few slides. We also did binary classifications like the detection of edge galaxies and bars. This is a rock curve that represents the true positive rate versus false positive rate. So you want this value to be high and this one to be low, like the, uh, the, like the green curve, which is what we obtain for the galaxy, edge on galaxies with uh, certain uh, values. Uh, and what I, mean, uh, what I mean by certain is that their uncertainties are within the, uh, below the one sigma distribution, and the uncertainties are derived by doing a cuffle this means that we train five separate models by varying a little bit the validation and the training sample. So you have uh, variations on the initialization of weights and on your training sample, and that gives you different probabilities and you can combine them to determine uh, uncertainties. And the fact that these uncertainties are meaningful is reflected by the fact that this rock curve work much better for the certain galaxies than for the uncertain galaxies. But on average, the accuracy is great. We get a 98% of accuracy for the edge on galaxies and a 93 for the bar galaxies, which is pretty good because detecting a bar is, is not a trivial task. Okay, so 
Uh, in the paper of 2022, we applied the sample to the manga uh, sample, which consists only of 10,000 galaxies, so only we were able to visually classify all of them. Uh, and this is the comparison of our visual classification with respect to the T-type, so you see there is a very nice correlation. And we also uh, set a, a flag if our visual classification was reliable, because even by eye, sometimes you don't know what you're detecting. So you can see how this uh, reliable classification really drops at the intermediate types, which are the most difficult ones to assign a category. And I also said that there are some galaxies that ha are classified as early type, but have T type above zero. Okay, what are these galaxies? Uh, they are galaxies which are small, faint, and uh, have very low uh, velocity uh, and have a low velocity dispersion. So they're consistent with galaxies being this like, but being too faint to show a clear uh, spiral structure or also fuzzy irregulars. Um, we also compared our results with the Galaxy Zoo. The first question of the Galaxy Zoo is not, is the galaxy elliptical or spiral, but is the galaxy smooth? or does it show features? So you can see that if we plot our classification versus the probability of being smooth for the galaxy Zoo, there's a non-negligible fraction of galaxies which are smooth, but according to our classification, they are spirals. And if you look at the uh, distribution in CERSIC index or B over T of these galaxies, they have low CERSIC index and they have a, a low B over T, so they're more consistent with being um, disks. So being smooth is not as equivalent of being elliptical. It means the features are unclear. So what we did with all this uh, classification, we published it in the sh uh, shape of uh, different catalogs. We did one uh, containing 6,000 galaxies for the uh, SDSS data. Uh, and we also, uh, in two different versions, you can uh, access the latest uh, version here. And we also published the, the manga catalog uh, in different verses uh, with its companion Pi More Photometric Catalog, which provides photometric fits like CERSIC index, B over T, uh, radius, etc. And I mentioned before manga, but I didn't explain what it is. It's a survey that is an IFU survey. So for each galaxy, you have many fibers and you can derive a spectra in different locations. So you will get to, to the maps of things like um, H alpha, rotation, dispersion, etc. So what we have not only published the catalogs, but we have used them for science. Remember this cartoon? Now we can do it with real data. This is the star formation rate versus mass color coded according to our T-type. And you can see that there is a very nice transition of colors where you have most of your late types in the uh, already quenched. You have your uh, high uh, T-type galaxies being low mass star forming galaxies, and you have your quenched galaxies uh, being intermediate types. So there's a very nice sequence here. We can also check how the morphology relates to kinematics. This is a very common plot showing the angular momentum. It's a measurement of the rotation, so high rotation, low rotation versus ellipticity. Uh, and this corner here shows the location of slow rotators. Uh, the three panels just uh, show galaxies that are better fit by one component, two components, or uh, equally, equally probable. But what I want you to focus is how well the uh, elliptical galaxies populate the slow rotating, galaxy, uh, slow rotating uh, region, while on the other hand, the late type galaxies are very fast rotating, and you have the, elliptical, um, the lenticular galaxies on the fast rotating region. And for, of course, I don't have time to go into the details. We did a, a long series of paper. We're taking advantage of the morphological classification. We studied the stellar population gradients. In this case, I'm showing age, metallicity, alpha enhancement, and mass to light ratio versus radius. So this is the center of the galaxy. This is the outskirts. And here I, I, I'm highlighting the difference between el, uh, fast rotating ellipticals and lenticulars. And there are clear differences between their stellar populations, suggesting that they're not the same objects as other authors in the literature uh, proposed. Okay, 
So, so far so good, things work very well, but that was because we had a great training sample, a very large training set. What happens if you don't have labels? For example, when the dark energy survey came, there were very little overlap with the previous morphological catalogs, so we could not apply the, uh, the CNNs as we did in previous works. So our question was, how much of the knowledge learned from the SSD images was learned is useful for the dark energy survey? And we did this test where we basically, so again, this is the, the rock curve. You want your data points to be up here in the corner. The, uh, and this is for the classification smooth and disk. The blue line is the results that we obtained for the previous SDSS sample. If you take the models trained with SDSS images and apply them to dark energy sample, the performance is much worse because there are subtle differences in how the instrumental effects, PSF, pixel size, depth of the survey. So your, your uh, machine learning code is not optimized for that data set. But if you, instead of start training from scratch, take your weights and then use only a few galaxies to adapt the neural network, which is called transfer learning, then you have this beautiful red curve using only 500 galaxies instead of 5,000. And we tested that for different questions. The results were very nice. And, and we demonstrated that recycling these weights can help you to reduce by one order of magnitude the size of your training sample. Uh, I'm, of course, not the only one who has done that. And in the machine learning conference, uh, Mike Walmsley saw these very nice results where they obtained a similar thing for the Galaxy Zoo. And also an interesting thing is that if you train a model which is able to do all the tasks at the same time, then uh, there is not much difference uh, when frozen or not frozen, when you've trained the different layers. Okay, but still the results I saw need around 500 galaxies labeled. What if you have no labels at all? Then you can use things like domain adaptation, when the trick here is that you have a set of data, for, uh, and this, uh, I'm, I'm taking this figure from Huerta's company 2023, who used this method to classify JWST galaxies. The idea here is that you have Candles galaxies with classifications and, double, and Sears galaxies without classification. So first you have a classifier that will uh, do, uh, create a, a feature space which will be flattened and then will go through your classification. And this part is like the classifier that I've been showing before. But now you have a set of data that don't have labels. They go to the same feature structure and then instead of going to the classifier, you go to a discriminator. And this discriminator needs to understand if the galaxy is a Sears or a Candles one. And you want to cheat this discriminator. You want this parameter space to be so similar for the two data sets so that, so, so that the discriminator won't be able to uh, say the difference. So you penalize when this, when this is clear and you optimize when this classification is doing good. And um, there are many interesting words by Cyprianovich. You can see, for example, how uh, before uh, domain adaptation, the one data set and the other data set lay in different parts of the feature space. And when you do the, the domain adaptation, now they're clustered together and it's difficult to distinguish them. Okay, so, so far we've moved in the low red sea bright end regime. But if we really want to understand how the properties of galaxies have evolved with time, we need to go to higher red shift. And distant galaxies are more difficult to classify because they look fainter, smaller, and even more important, we don't even have catalogs to train those samples with. So, and here I want to highlight, for example, uh, the catalogs that I used in the previous papers were limited to magnitude 17. And this is the distribution of magnitude for the dark energy survey. So you can see that it barely covers, what, 5% of the data? And we want to push higher, right? We want to be able to classify to higher magnitudes. So the idea we had was, okay, 
we have the original dark energy survey images, uh, some of them with, with labels because we could cross match the dark energy survey with the SDSS catalog of 600,000 galaxies. Because we know how, to, how galaxies are affected by being more distant, let's emulate them. So we apply things like cosmological dimming, um, um, reducing the pixels, the, the size in pixels and, and the flux, uh, also convolved with the correct PSF and noise, and even did a, a little bit of uh, car correction and evolution. And this is how the same galaxy looks like when you push it to higher redshift or fainter magnitudes. And this is the same. And the trick here was that we used these images, but we kept the original labels. So we fed the model with all these images saying, all these are spirals, all these are ellipticals. And we have excellent results. Here you can see, again, we trained five different models, and you can see that uh, the accuracy is 97%. And, but also the precision and recall are very good, as you can see for the confusion matrix. And more importantly, we study if these models depend, if the results depend on the observed magnitude, and we didn't see any dependence. You may see a little bit of wiggling here, but please notice that the lower end here is 90%. So all of our values, precision, recall, accuracy, are above 22%, 92% for all magnitude ranges. So we, we uh, demonstrated that machines can recover features which are somehow hidden to the human eye because by eye it was very difficult to classify some of these galaxies. And to further test if our results were uh, reliable, we made use of the Vipers spectral classification, uh, which classifies galaxies into passive, intermediate and star forming according to their spectra. And you can see what a very nice correlation with our morphological classification there is with a 97% of true positive, for example. So again, we applied all these models to 27 million galaxies in the Dark Energy Survey, and we released the largest morphological catalog up to date, uh, reaching magnitudes up to 21.5. So you may wonder, what happens when you apply models trained with, uh, with only the, uh, the bright end? And this is exactly what we tested when we compared our catalog with the catalog made by Chen, <laughs> in which uh, they uh, basically train with the labels they had up to magnitude 17. And this is the comparison of their classification with our classification. And you can see that there is a very nice correlation, so you want this matrix to be uh, diagonal, uh, up to precisely magnitude 19 and then this relation completely breaks. And their model only predicts spiral galaxies. It's not able to identify elliptical galaxies. So don't train with a sample different to your target. Okay. Uh, there, so far, for everything that I showed, you need a little bit of labels. So for some projects more, for, for some less. But what if you don't want to use any labels at all? This, this is what is known as unsupervised learning. And the idea is to let the algorithm find any uh, underlying structure in the data. And you can see here a, a plot where uh, galaxies are more or less ordered. You can see here the, the clear effect of the color, but also if you look at different regions, these galaxies look uh, similar. Uh, you may need the data at some point to interpret your, your results, of course. Um, but this is a good way to detect anomalies, and there are different uh, flavors, so you can do clustering, dimensionality reduction, and contrastive learning. For example, you don't really need to do very fancy things. You can go to classical PCA, which is basically a dimensionality reduction, to try to summarize the immense amount of data that we have in the manga survey. In this case, we're focusing uh, in a series of paper by a PhD student, Josep Tos. Uh, we, uh, we used the uh, lenticular galaxies from Manga, um, constructed radial spectra, so for every 10 steps, uh, 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 in 10 steps of radia, we constructed different spectra. And we can project this spectra in the PC1, PC2 components and see how uh, the radial profiles change in this PC1, PC2. 
we can summarize that information even more by vectorizing this and because this is the passive region and this the direction is towards more activity, then we can define uh, activity gradients which are flat, which increase outside in or inside out. And we've done several studies that I don't have time to show you here, but just uh, wanted to show the technique. There's also what is known as self-supervised machine learning, where basically your labels come because you're showing the same image with a little bit of a variation. So you take one image, you do some random sifts, but it, you, you tell to the encoder, okay, this is the same image, so put them together in your parameter space and put any other image more distance to, the, to them. So at the end, you have a feature space that clusters together, that groups together things which are similar to each other. This is what we did in a paper by Regina Sarmiento in 2021, again using the manga data, and as input, she used the uh, different maps, uh, like flag stage metallicity, and then to visualize the results using a new map and a clustering, what I want to highlight is that uh, the three groups she found correlate very nicely with the morpho classical morphological relation as the T-type, and also with the main sequence, the red, uh, the red sequence and, and the green valley. Uh, and you can also do this with, for example, James Webb uh, galaxies. Uh, so these are a, a set of simulated JWST, and you can see how it correlates very well with CERSIC index. This is a work by Vega Ferrero. When you compare it with the real observations, the real observations don't really lie in the same area as the simulation, so this is highlighting differences between the two samples. I don't want to tell you more about that because there is an interesting talk, it's a talk about this uh, today at uh, 3 p.m. for those who are in, in the machine learning conference. Okay, and I'm reaching to the last part of, of my talk in good time, so I'm going to take a moment to drink water. We can take questions if you'd like to. Yeah, uh, would you like any questions before we move on? Yeah, well, I have a quick, I'm going to uh, uh, abuse my position as speaker. Can you just, it's great that you've made all these catalogs available. Can you make a comment about how you estimate the uncertainty on the morphological types in your catalogs? Yeah, I didn't explain that very well. Um, basically, uh, what we did was to train five different um, models, and these models have different values, so you can measure the, the deviation, the standard deviation of the output and that is a proxy. It's not the best uncertainty estimation, uh, but it, it is meaningful in the sense, uh, do you remember when I showed the rock curves, uh, they work better for the ones that have smaller uncertainties. Okay. So, we went to higher red shift, uh, we tried to do things without labels, but now we want to go deeper. By deeper, I mean integrating more time seeing what is in the outskirts of the galaxies. Because we know uh, the hierarchical paradigm tells us that galaxies are not isolated bodies, that they suffer interactions all throughout their lives. And these interactions actually leave very uh, nice remnants uh, known as tidal features, tidal tails, shells, and so on. But these are invisible for uh, uh, shallow surveys like SDSS. So you can compare the same image using SDSS or uh, a deeper survey. You can see that how all these uh, tidal remnants become evident only when you integrate um, enough time. So uh, in, in, a, in the paper that I'm going to present, we wanted to, to, make, to, be, to test if the CNNs were able to detect galaxies that had tidal features around them. So in principle, again, it's a classical cat and dog problem with images, should be easy. But there, there's a big problem. These features are very faint, uh, and there, there are very few catalogs uh, that, that have tidal features. And although there is ongoing efforts, uh, like the one by Sola, and there was a pioneer attempt by Walmsley, but the accuracy was only 76% accuracy because look at the numbers, very, very small training sample. But these are, uh, so what we did was to use uh, the catalog by uh, Margaret, Gartin, uh, Margaret Martin, which is based on simulations, and 
uh, the images were classified by professional astronomers in different types like pre, uh, merger remnant, tidal tail, stellar stream, a shell. And what I did to, to convert those votes into classes was if the fraction, so if the fraction of votes divided by the number of classifiers is above one, then it's a positive. If it's zero, then it's a negative. And it's, if it's in between, I'm going to remove it from my sample because I don't know what, what is the class. And you can see here the effect of uh, going fainter. So this is a, a galaxy observed at 36 magnitude per arc sec, while this is at 28 magnitude per arc sec. And I don't know if you can see it well, but basically the fraction of tidal here is 0.2, while the fraction of tidal here is 3. So how the votes of the classifiers change when you go to fainter magnitudes. And this is, uh, again, the highlight. If, uh, the red ones show the distribution of the images which are classified as positives, and you see that great dependence with the uh, uh, depth of the image and with the red shift. So we did a little bit the same as uh, what we did for the galaxy morphology. And here you can see that the accuracy now it's smaller, it's only 85%, but because this is a much more challenging task, it's not as easy to separate ellipticals and, and spirals rather than to detect these features. And in addition, the training sample was small. We studied the dependence of, uh, of our results with the different morphological classes, uh, morphological in the sense of the tidal feature classes, so we were able to recover all the shells and the mergers and the tails were the ones which were more difficult to be recovered. And of course, we also studied uh, the, the metrics with respect to the depth of these images. Uh, and here I want you to see, this is the fraction of detected features by the, by the classifiers. So there's a clear correlation between the deeper the images are, the, the more classifiers detect the features. Um, our accuracy and, uh, and, comp and purity, which is the red line, are more or less stable throughout the, throughout the full regime, but it's the, it's the completeness that uh, is seriously affected. So if you want to have at least 90% uh, completeness, you really need deep images to, to retrieve this, these things. We had real data coming from HSC, visually classified, so we tried to apply our models to that and the performance was not good. We state that in the paper. We even tried transfer learning, it didn't work. And uh, my intuition is that, first of all, the, classi the visual classification of this data are very uncertain. I want to highlight here that for the galaxies that are classified as detections, only 15% uh, of them are classified as such by the four classifiers. So there's a lot of disagreement between the classification. It's, it's not easy to say if there is a detection or not. Also, the data is much shallower. It's 26 magnitude. We were talking before simulations of 31. Uh, and the simulations are not completely realistic. They don't have exactly the same angular resolution. They don't have artifacts, as sky subtraction, background sources. So this, again, highlights the fact that you have to be very careful when you train with simulations and apply to real data. And as Navila was saying the other day in the conference, we need end-to-end -end simulations, like really take into account all the observational effects. So if we want to increase the statistics of, um, of tidal features and tidal tails that we observe, uh, we need to do on-purpose surveys. And this is precisely the objective of, of Arrakis, Analysis of resolved remnants of accredited galaxies as a key instrument for halo surveys. I will never learn this name. Did you guys write you? Yeah, basically. <laughs> so this is a, a new um, FEESA uh, mission approved in December, uh, led by Spain. And I have a, also a leading role in some of the working packages and as PI of the Plan Nacional. And the idea is to sample 100 nearby galaxies to unprecedented depths, reaching 31 magnitudes, to study the nature of dark matter. You can see here how different flavors provide different uh, number of satellite galaxies. Uh, also to study stellar streams and diffuse light. And of course, what I'm interested in, galaxy mass assembly and mass accretion. 
So the telescope will be very simple. It's a binocular with four filters to in the optical to in the infrared and will provide images observing these beautiful tails that we'll be able to, to study. So now, how can we use machine? <laughs> and before I move on, uh, as I said, I'm the coordinator of one of these packages and we, we have uh, two positions open at CEFCA, one as a software engineer and then the other one as a postdoc working with me on applying machine learning techniques to the analysis of these images. So if you're looking for a job, don't hesitate to contact me. So what is the idea now? How can we use machine learning to study 100 galaxies? Do we really need machine learning? We need that because we can do segmentation. Instead of classification, the idea is to do segmentation. And we are doing tests with models like Segment Anything Model, which is a, a, an, it's not open source, but you can, re, uh, yeah, I think you can download the code and you can use it on the interface. And basically, you input an image. It, it doesn't matter the texture this image has, and it identifies the different segments. So, of course, we can do this with galaxies too. And this is a very preliminary test where, again, using simulations at different magnitudes, uh, we're trying to see what, what the segmentation recovers to optimize the depth we need to reach to uh, not to lose any significant information. And I'm done. Uh, I'd like you to take some messages home. So deep learning is a very useful tool for classifying galaxy images, but you have to be careful with some things. Supervised deep learning needs large training samples that must be from the same domain, the magnitude range, the instrument, uh, etc. Be careful with applying simulations, simulation based models to real data. Always have a backup test so you can test that your results are right. We also demonst demonstrated that there are some tasks for which the machine, machines still have problems. For example, detecting the faint and subtle um, uh, features like tidal in interactions. This is still a, challenging, a challenge and an open problem for uh, deep learning. We can uh, overcome the lack of labels by using things like transfer learning, emulating galaxies, or using unsupervised learning. And finally, please do not blindly apply your models to data from different domains as a training sample because I uh, can give you the, the right answers, the wrong answers, sorry. Thank you very much, Helena, for the very nice talk and lots of those wonderful results. And there's a question already from Gary. I'll just give him my microphone. Thanks very much, Elena. Uh, your work is uh, very impressive. So I have uh, uh, two questions. Um, one, you mentioned that you cons when you do the morphological training, you, you don't use the color information. And indeed, uh, people might not, want to use the might not want you to use the color information so that they can see the effects of colors later. Or you could do it the other way and say, but maybe I can do better with the colors. And then when you compare to, to the experts, they were probably, or, or the Galaxy Zoo uh, volunteers, they were probably biased by the colors they saw. So uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, that, that's a very nice point. I, I've discussed about this several times. Um, I think we should focus, like the morphological classification is based on the shape and it should not be biased with the color. If you give the color information, because most of your ellipticals will be red, then it will be more difficult for the model to classify as a, an elliptical something that looks bluish. Mm -hmm. And it may look bluish because there was a lack of a filter or something like that. But also, if we want to identify the outliers, so what I'm interested in is precisely in those galaxies which are trans transforming. Mm -hmm. So that may be red, but are still spirals or the other way around. Mm -hmm. So if I'm adding the color information in my model, my prior is going to be a, a, a affected and will give more weight to, to yeah, it, it, it will be more, uh, probably more easy to classify as an elliptical something that is red, when precisely if I want to study the color morphological relation, this yes. has to be independently derived. 
Thanks. And then uh, another quick question is, um, I always thought that you need huge samples, and that's what you said in your conclusion, uh, uh, to train things. But in the end, you did do training. You, you did uh, classify the, the uh, Sloan galaxies, the half million Sloan galaxies, with, uh, and you measured T parameters, which were uh, trained with the Nair sample of only mm -hmm. 10,000 and not a million uh, galaxies. So is that reliable? Yeah, that's a very good point. And probably, uh, if I can go back, uh, of course, a training sample uh, which is smaller than the full data set may not capture the full complexity. It's very far away. Uh, Maybe I fell asleep after that. <laughs> <laughs> this one, here, okay. Yes, so, one of the proble problems or one of the deficits of the, oops, oh, what happened? There, uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh my god, I'm sorry. Nice. I'm going back, oh no, sorry. Always happens to me in talks. Okay, there we go. So, uh, I, well, I don't know if I can point, but anyway, you can see, so the points that you, the, the individual data points are individual galaxies. And you can see there is a lack of galaxies at T-type larger than seven, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Because these very late type galaxies are, are not frequent. So in a sample of 14,000 galaxies, there won't be many of them. So probably for this population, yeah, the T-type is not as well characterized as for others that there are more abundant galaxies. Um, but, but still, it's pretty good for the others. Say it again? But your work was, works pretty well for the non-irregular galaxies. For the lower T-types, it works very yeah. well. Yeah, and, and if I have to be uh, sincere, we did the, for the 10,000, not for the 6,000 galaxies, but for the 10,000 galaxies of manga, we visually checked them, all of them. So, um, and, and the agreement, I, I have a backup, a backup slide, but it's not in the PDF. But, and the agreement with the visual classification is, is pretty impressive. Yeah, thank you. There, there's a question in the back, just introduce yourself. Huh? Uh, hi, uh, Ben Gibbon from Edinburgh. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so if I understood correctly, the uncertainty on the classifications was approximated by the variation across the five different uh, neural nets. So um, I hear about you know, Bayesian neural nets, and which I think can output an uncertainty on the point estimate or point classification, uh, as well as the classification itself. Would that have been possible to construct it that way in, in this case, and is there an advantage of doing it that way? Yeah, indeed I tried doing that, but uh, uh, training a Bayesian uh, neural network is more difficult because basically you have double parameters, right? You have a mu and a sigma for each weight in, instead of one weight. So the results, uh, like the accuracy uh, or this um, uh, mean square error for the t-type were worst. And at that time, I preferred to have a, to have a more ac mm, accurate value on the t-type, even though my uncertainties were not the uh, uh, statistically perfect uncertainties. But at the end, nobody uses the uncertainties. I, I mean, we are super worried about them. But if the users of the catalog, um, I think it's better to have a non-biased value than a better estimated uncertainty. But of course, you can do that with, with Bayesian neural networks. Okay, there's another come. Uh, I think this. Do, say your name and. Uh... Hi, I'm uh, Jelle Mess from Leiden University, and I have a master student actually also working on the detection of stellar streams. So I'm quite interested in that. And I was wondering, you mentioned that for morphological classification, you would only want to use the, uh, the intensity and not the colors. Mm -hmm. Would you use the same for the stellar streams? Because you know that they're usually more red. That's a good question. For this work, I only use one color band for the tidal stream detection, but probably for, for the Arrakis work, I will definitely use the color information, I think, because it's giving you hints on how you can differentiate the background, uh, foreground, and, and stellar streams. That, that, that's important. And because then we don't really want to study the, well, yes, of course, you want to study colors, but 
it's, it will not be as biased, it will be of much help, I think. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question there. Yes, thanks for the talk and uh, apologies, I missed the beginning. So Agnes maybe, Ferti. Uh, yeah, Agnes Ferti from Slack. Uh, so maybe you touched on that, but um, I've always wondered because, so some effects on galaxy, like galaxies that are co-localized will have some effect, like for instance, they will align with the tidal fields or things like that. Can we take that into account when we train a neural network? And I'm thinking, like, my first thought would be to actually use large images rather than just cutouts. Does that make sense? Do yeah. you have any That's thoughts? That's a good point. I didn't thought about it for the tidal tails. But it, uh, on the opposite, I'm working on a project now for uh, identifying member, for membership of clusters of, galax uh, of galaxies. And for that, we are, try we are using the full, full field of view because the location in the cluster may be useful for identifying the cluster members there. Thanks. Are there any more comments or questions? I, I have a quick comment. Um, you didn't say very much in your talk about comparisons with uh, simulations or um, what physical processes you can infer from the morphologies. And I know there's a lot of work that has been done, and that's probably too much to talk about. But I wonder if you could say one or two words about how you go from morphology to an understanding of the physical processes in galaxy formation. Um, there's a, a project that I'm working on right now that I really like, and it's precisely to apply unsupervised learning to the star formation histories of galaxies from simulations. And I don't have the result here, but it's beautiful how the star formation histories clusters and then you can again group your galaxies and see what is the outcome what is the outcome of those star formation histories which kind of morphologies you get unfortunately you can only do that with simulations because to infer the star formation histories of these galaxies it's another topic that also uh, takes off my my sleep uh, sometimes but but yeah uh, there's a question from here. Uh, just say your name and who you're from. Sure, yeah. Hey, Luis Suelves from the NCBJ at Poland. So yeah, thank you very much for the very nice, uh, very nice talk. Um, so my question, it's, so it's a bit strange, but let's see if I can like, word it properly. So when you are working on the finding the tidal, uh, the, the, the tidal structures, and there were like, basically like, bridges and, and tails were kind of like, getting a bit like, less easy to find, right? Um, have you seen like um, because of course you analyzed how it was going with like the depth of the of the survey, but because I had a feeling that maybe like the reason why it's difficult to get it with SSC is the fact that you have like so the brighter is the tidal structure, that means that also like the usually the br the brighter it is also the bigger and like the more resolved would it be right mm -hmm. so could it be that the problem is coming from having just too many low resolution structures uh, sources stars tiny galaxies around like spoiling the image could that be one of the reasons not in this case because these are uh, simplistic simulations that don't have background objects yeah. and indeed at some point no, we wanted to we thought about including these background objects, but then the visual classification would have changed. So we left it like for a um, yeah. follow-up. Um, but what I can tell that I, I, I passed relatively quickly, but it, I think it's an important point. It's, it seems like all the shells are being recovered, and it's the case now if you, I hope this pointer works, yeah. So this is the, this is the output probability of the model, and this is the threshold to the uh, classify something as a stream or not, as a tidal feature. So you see that for all, all the shells, this probability is high. This means that we recover all the shells. But the fact is that all the shells are classified as other features. So all the images that have a shell, they also have a tidal tail or they have a bridge, etc. So probably is not that they're the easiest to identify, are the most evident, right? And because they're most evident, then you classify them more easily. I see, thank you. Do you have some more comments? No questions on Slack, I guess, Guillaume. Okay, so uh, while, we're, while we're waiting, why is Arrakis a binocular telescope? 
Uh, what does the binocular do, do for you exactly? There are, are two detectors in each of the binoculars? There are two binoculars. It's 2D? 3D? <laughs> it's two binoculars, one for each filter. Okay. And the field of view of the telescope is how much? The field of... Uh, I don't remember now. Okay. Yeah, I'm bad with numbers. Because there's another telescope that might be able to do some of that work as well. Have you thought about applying those techniques to that data? Uh, to, uh, which one? The LBT or...? The Euclid? Uh. Ah, Euclid, yes. <laughs> So there's a big problem with Euclid, uh, is the, the uh, sky background subtraction pipeline removes a lot of these data features. I'm not so sure, but we can not talk so about sure? that offline. Okay, we can talk about that later. But yeah, of course, Euclid will be a, a very nice uh, survey to, to study tidal, tidal features, yes. Yeah. Okay, if there are any more questions, last questions. Thank you again, Helena, for a very nice talk.